Hi, this is Dustin Hausner. I'm the Jewish Outreach and Program Director at the Wayne YMCA. All our programs are funded through the Jewish Federation of Northern New Jersey. Uh, today, we have a wonderful special guest. Uh, we have with us uh, Rabbi Dr. Carrie Tuling, who has a wonderful upcoming book and uh, wanted to have this opportunity for us to get a sneak peek and to learn uh, a little bit more about the author. So, um, Rabbi Doctor, uh, very nice to have you on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'm loving the moniker. I'm loving Rabbi Doctor. Um, I was wondering if you could please, uh, for anyone who's unfamiliar, especially since this is your first book, um, would you mind talking a little bit about uh, who you are, um, a little bit of your background? Uh, we would love to learn more. Okay, thanks. Uh, I was ordained by Hebrew Union College uh, in 2004 in their Cincinnati campus. And when I finished the ordination program, I stayed on for a doctorate. They have a program where you can overlap that last year with the first year. And so I, was, I received a uh, PhD actually in um, Jewish thought. Uh, officially, it's something like Hebrew letters and literature um, from Hebrew Union College in 2013. And what I did is focused on um, Jewish thought uh, doing comp exams in, in uh, modern and, and medieval, doing um, one of the comp exams in the theology of the rabbinic literature and one of the comp exams in um, German Jewish experience, Wissenschaft des Judentums. So. Um, oh, it sounds very impressive to say the very least. Oh, thank you. But <laughs> so, wonderful. so, where are you, um, if I may ask, um, are you currently um, with a specific congregation or uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I am a congregational rabbi. I serve a congregation in Glastonbury, Connecticut, which is one of the suburbs of Hartford. We're in the Hartford area. Um, and it's a lovely, lovely place to be, actually. Uh, I'm a solo rabbi and uh, I enjoy it thoroughly, actually. Uh, it's, um, it's a really um, engaging kind of thing to do um, because you know, I'm interested in theology. Here is where actually the, the effects of what you believe really matter and show up. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm really glad that I have this opportunity to be a congregational rabbi. Very nice. So I want to um, ask you, so the title of your book is Thinking About God, Jewish Views. So you decided to go with a non-controversial subject. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm very curious, you know, many people that I've seen who do Jewish literature, you know, they'll either go fiction or they'll go to like certain scripture. You are going through a very big topic that mm -hmm. obviously, depending on which sect and belief system you go into, has very different versions and um, ideas yeah. on the subject. So I'm very curious, what made you decide to want to take on this subject? Well, actually, how it happened was it was uh, Barry Schwartz, uh, also a rabbi who is the, um, uh, I'm not sure if his title is specifically CEO or director, but he's, he's in charge of JPS. Mm -hmm. And um, he had actually suggested to me, because he saw from my resume, we were talking, and he saw from my resume that I had taught a course called Jewish Con God Concepts. Um, we had innovated it, we had created it in uh, University of Cincinnati when I was working there as an adjunct. And then I also taught it um, at SUNY Plattsburgh. And he was like, um, tell me about this. What did, you, what did you use for this? And what, what kind of work, what kind of uh, book would you want for this? And what I had done, which was interesting to him, is organize the topic around um, questions about God as opposed to most of the time these kinds of books or these kinds of courses say, here's this unique, unusual thinker about God, and here's another unique, unusual thinker about God. And they'll all be listed and maybe they might be listed chron chronologically, but there's no attempt usually, I mean, uh, generalizing, to uh, connect each thinker together and say, actually, they're in conversation with the, the, uh, the, with the Bible, with the rabbinic literature, with all of the other uh, things that have gone before. And so he really liked the idea that I was organized around an idea, a, a question. And so that's how we ended up organizing this book, is it's actually 10 questions. Well, it's more than 10 questions, but it's 10 topical uh, areas about God. And then we work through, I say we, because it was a lot, I worked pretty closely with their editing team to do it. Mm -hmm. um, each of these um, questions and um, moved chronologically within the question. So like, for example, uh, does God have a body or do, does God have a gender? Mm -hmm. It would have Bible and then uh, liturgy, then the rabbinic literature, 
than uh, medieval literature and then modern literature and give you a way of kind of walking through how has this conversation unfolded over time? So um, we were actually very fortunate. We did an interview with the director of uh, JPS. Uh, oh, okay. Anyone who hasn't uh, watched it, it's a really good interview. He's, he's really great. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious because you mentioned, and I think it's interesting. So instead of going in the area of like, let's say, saying the thoughts of like Barack Spinoza, Martin Ber Berber, and kind of going with the clashing ideologies, you set out to do a set of, I, I would suppose would be, um, fascinating questions, which I am curious where you got, where you, why you chose those 10 questions, right. but you decided to go with questions and then using your knowledge of the different perspectives, trying to answer it through almost a, a linear concept, it sounds like. Right. So <clears throat> what we're trying to do is, um, some of what we're trying to, sh sh some of what we're showing is that um, um, later, uh, is the, uh, taking the advantage of or has the benefit of having seen what the conversation's been. Mm -hmm. uh, but it isn't necessarily better, obviously, in the sense that some of the really good insights can be early. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was part of it. Um, and also part of it was uh, it, this, this would allow students, what we're hoping to do is allow students to see that um, Jewish thought isn't monolithic in any way. Mm -hmm. uh, it's rather nuanced um, that um, in each section, we are, it's not uncommon to see somebody who is a rationalist next to a mystic, for example, mm -hmm. um, and to see that uh, how, how it, each question gets um, thought through will vary a lot. And it, and that was, it was really fun to do. I mean, I got to say, it was really fun because I got to read a lot of stuff <laughs> and pick out the, the, the most, I, I, uh, the, the most enjoyable part of the whole process was well, aside from working with JPS, because they're awesome. Um, <laughs> I mean, they are, they really are. Uh, but to pick out the, the specific text to say, that's the text I want, because as much as possible, I wanted to make sure that it looked like they were in conversation, because that's not actually that hard. And so you'd have a, a, the Bible, and then later you're like, oh, they quoted it, <laughs> you know, and, and <laughs> be able to have, you can see how this same text, like it, the best example of that is the one that is about uh, individual providence, talks about the story of um, Kana, um, and she prays to God, and she's mistaken for a drunken woman in the process, and so um, Eli the priest says, get, you, get yourself out of here, woman, um, and, and remove the drink from you, and she uh, ends up being, um, God ends up heeding what she has to say, and she ends up pregnant uh, with the prophet um, Samuel. So what happens with that is that story gets, you know, cited over and over in pretty much like the rabbinic texts had a field day with it. And you see it in multiple cases where it gets uh, uh, discussed or it, um, so that that was part of the fun of it was to find find these links and articulate them. Hmm. Uh, so I'm very curious. I mean, it sounds deeply fascinating. And I think anytime when you could work on something and enjoy working on it, that's always uh, a wonderful thing. Because I know certainly with books, there's a lot of research and sometimes it can be very tedious. So I, I'm glad to hear that you enjoyed it and obviously working with JPS. But I'm curious about, you don't have to tell me all 10 questions because I want people to read the book, of course. Okay. But, um, <laughs> I can't tell you all 10 questions. Like, I was going to say, you know, if uh, I don't want one of those where we you watch the interview and you're like, oh my God, I just gave away the entire book. <laughs> so. A little hard. It's it's, it's 440 pages. I, it, we'd have to have a long interview. <laughs> no, I, you know, I got the time. You seem very nice. Uh, <laughs> but, Thank you. But let me ask you, because you start off and um, when I looked online, um, like I know GPS mentioned and I think other websites mentioned, one of the areas where you mentioned is, um, you know, gender. Mm -hmm. and uh, the concept of that with God. I'm curious for that question, what made you out of the 10 questions want to select that one? And uh, are there other questions you can feel comfortable saying that you selected that we would find in the book and uh, read about? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, <clears throat> in the case of gender, part of the reason why we wa I wanted to talk about it is a good portion of the feminist critique of the Bible centers on the issue of gender and does the idea of having a singular God that it, who is male, I mean, like the um, I don't think God is male, but the idea of a God that is male mm -hmm. and only male, um, does that then create uh, or reinforce ideas of patriarchy? Mm 
And so we want to, one of the reasons why I wanted to have gender as one of the questions is so that we can really look at that theologically. What happens when you say God is one and male? Or is it that God transcends gender? Is it when we look at the, it ended up, uh, a lot of the conversation ends up focusing on the question of prayer texts. And does it matter if we leave it as he capitalized, you know, um, and it also had a little bit about, um, more than a little bit about Hebrew being a gendered language. And we have a number of these uh, God images that are gendered in Hebrew, but the gender is irrelevant. Like rock has a gender, e each word has a gender. Mm -hmm. And so what does it mean when we say God is a rock or when we say that uh, God is um, a warrior or when we say God is a, uh, a father, like a, um, a good portion of that se section was on the Unum Malkinu, the our father, our king. Um, what does it mean when we say that? Mm -hmm. And um, how are we reinforcing the idea that men are more important? And how are we able to transcend that idea and get past that? And so that was part of the reason why gender was part of the conversation. Some of the other questions we start, I start with, um, uh, you know, the question of creation and um, evil, <clears throat> sorry. Um, we also talk, I also talk about, um, does God have a body? And that's something that actually really works at Maimonides and, and that's an important concept in Jewish thought. So that's part of the reason why that one's there. Um, providence, um, what does Jewish law mean? Like, is it, is it revealed law? And um, is it a binding law? You know, what does it mean to be in covenant? These are the kinds of questions that were being addressed. And so, um, one of the, I, I do actually think the gender uh, chapter is one of the stronger chapters. It ended up being really fascinating because also what came into it was the question of like, um, is your biology determinative? And, um, you know, like biological gen biological sex versus gender. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, how do we deal with um, people who don't choose gender as mm -hmm. a defining label? And how does the tradition res um, interact with that if the tradition has been gendered? Um, does the tradition need to change? And uh, if so, how? And so there's a lot of questions. It, it's kind of fun. This is why it was a lot of fun to write is you'd have, you'd start with, does God have a body? But you start, or does God have a gender? And you start actually pulling it apart and you're like, well, there's a lot of little sub questions in there. You know, does that make sense? <laughs> no, it makes sense. And again, it makes me more, number one, want to read it, but second, oh. <laughs> um, you know, go through and, and ask more questions about it because I think this is very fascinating. But I'm curious in the case of like, let's say, well, actually, I'll, I'll take this two ways. Uh, one, we'll start with, does it focus a lot on what is the text say in regard to possibly changing the text in order to like, is there an answer to, like, you ask a question, you have these different perspectives, like, is it, which is a conversation, you, you said it's uh, in a conversational format. Right. Is the idea in the end of each chapter that there is an actual answer, or is it kind of left to the reader to, based on the conversation, um, right. select what they believe is the one that connects to the answer, in other words? It, it more, it, the latter. It, the reader actually needs to put together what they believe. We have these questions and, we an and I answer them um, in, in, a, in, a, in a fashion, but they also sort of open it up in the sense of here's how to think, but the point, the goal of the book was to say, here's a lot of this conversation mm -hmm. and most of it has been not that accessible because if you're not born into knowing all about Judaism, mm -hmm. um, it's hard to learn. Uh, it's not impossible, but it's hard to find. What happens to us is that, that when you, if you're a newbie into Judaism, you get essentially this fire hose of material and there's nothing to do with it. And instead, what, what I'm trying to do with this book is say, here's a hook and here's a hook and here's a hook. And you can hang this thing on this point and this on this point. And that's how you're going to be able to get a sense of how this all works. And um, it, here's how to think about it. And that allows you to get more uh, nuanced and sophisticated in your understanding of Jewish thought, if that makes sense. No, it does. I'm curious in regards to the conversational, um, we'll use the example of the body, like does uh, God, does Hashem have a body? Does the conversation, is it something where it's, 
a grow upon each of the different philosophies being shared or is it something where it's almost like not an argument but you have differencing viewpoints being shared and it's almost like a back and forth just because you know there's obviously you could be reading it and it can be a justification of whatever the main point is or it could easily be like one philosopher said this and the other one said wait 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 no 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 and then goes back and forth i'm just curious if the whoever reads it will they have a diversity of different perspectives in that way or is it going to be something that's kind of like an ever-growing but a singular perspective it's a uh, diverse um, perspectives in the case of the body for example the one who argues most strenuously against the idea that god has a body is moses Maimonides. and um this book i think you know if you want to say who gets the best um uh, press in it. <laughs> you know, um, uh, you, you, I think in reading it, you would understand that I think Maimonides' argument is the strongest one. So I, in that sense, I show up. Um, but um, I also spend a lot of time making sure you understand what the other positions are. So uh, Whistlegrad um, is one of the ones in there, and he's saying that God has to have a body in order to be able to interact with people. I don't find that as, as um, convincing, but what I want to do in this is to make sure that um, in each case, the, the, fir the first primary directive, the first um, intention is to say, you will understand what so-and-so said, hmm. even if you're a newbie, even if you, you know, like this is the first book on Jewish anything you've ever read. I want you to be able to sit down and be like, so that's what Maladie says about that, huh? And have at least some, you know, have some sense of what that is. It's, in the case of Maimonides, it's hard because he's he's not um, uh, intro level stuff. He, you know, it, it, no. it, that actually was hard. <laughs> um, but then also, having read that and read each of the other people that are in this uh, section, go, I see why the author thinks this way. I get, I get where she's coming from. Okay. And She's also taught me how to think about this in the sense of I, I've followed each of these arguments and they're all good arguments. I mean, the, we, we, we haven't put any um, clunkers in there. I hope not. <laughs> um, so the fact that if I don't agree with the author, I don't agree with Maimonides or I don't agree with, you know, any one of these people, um, it's because I'm engaging in, you know, speaking from the perspective of the reader, I'm engaging in this conversation and I'm thinking for myself. And that's what I'm hoping what everybody will do is think for themselves and go, huh, this is really interesting because I keep joking that why people don't like pay attention to things like say basketball as opposed to this all day. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, uh, basketball is lovely, but this is a lot more interesting. I think. I mean, uh, but what I'm trying to say is 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 this idea that um, I'm hoping that people will see why it's interesting, and then use this as a way to think in their own terms about what they believe. And so you don't need to be Jewish to read this book. It's not, and nor do you need. You know, I come out of the reform movement. You don't need to be reformed to read this book. Mm. Um, nor am I trying to convince you to be a reformed Jew. I mean, if you want to be, great. But, uh, <laughs> you know, like, we have this lovely congregation in Glastonbury. Okay, so you don't have a pet car in the back of the book. Good to know. So, but, uh, <laughs> but, but that's not the only answer, and it's not the only defensible answer. The, the, no matter, you know, like, there's a number of really good positions in Jewish thought and Jewish history and Jewish understanding that are decent, reasonable, understand, understandable, defensible, um, and I want, or, or outside of Judaism as well, and I don't mean to say Judaism has every answer, and I'm sorry, but everybody else is wrong, to the contrary. I just want you to understand why when somebody comes at it from the Jewish point of view, this is why, and what, what they're trying to say. Does that make sense? No, it does, and let me say I appreciate, first of all, that it's, that one of the main goals was to make it um, accessible for let's say someone who w did not have that great knowledge, um, you know, as someone who wears a bow tie and just looks smart. Um, I <laughs> that. Uh, but but let, me, um, let me ask you, because obviously these are very important arguments for many people who um, when they pick up this book. And, you know, you mentioned Maimonides, who of course is a very well-known, revered uh, mm -hmm. philosophical thinker in Judaism. But I'm curious, um, can you mention any of the other names of people that may uh, pop up in the book? And also, was there a specific, uh, checks and balances process on why these people were selected? Like, was it just that they had really good answers or was there kind of something where you just thought it would be the most interesting to put these people together? Like it, almost the, the dream list of people you would sit in a table and listen to their thoughts. 
some of the all of the above actually what happens is in some cases it's clear um, if you're going to talk about um, providence for example you, you um, well, or if you're going to talk about god's body we'll start with Maimonides. you're going to need to talk about Maimonides. you can't not talk about Maimonides. but there are others that are also really relevant um the what i think the, what we what i've done is um the rabbinic literature there's a nice collection of rabbinic stuff mm -hmm. and that's better information than most you know like most they don't get credit for being the theologians that they are mm. um and this but what i mean is you know the the, the folks who wrote the talmud is what i mean by the rabbinic literature mm -hmm. um and we also have I mean, in the medieval period um sadia gon is part of it Bahia ibn Pakuda. um there's also some um medieval um out of the prayers that were written um we have some of the martyrology in there um so there's a number of things from the medieval period from the modern period it's a pretty wide ranging one it's uh heschel and kaplan mm -hmm. and but also some you know some so some of the the obvious greats but also folks like fishbain and um uh arthur green we have people like um borowitz eugene borowitz is in there um there's steinberg's in there um uh, you know so it, it, it there's it, um Soloveitchik, of course uh, a couple times more than a few times you'll you'll find i argue with against him um <laughs> it, which is fine i mean of course they do no judgment no judgment <laughs> I haven't read the book, so I can't say, wait a minute. <laughs> now, Soloveitchik's in there, uh, Schneerson's in there. Um, we have a good amount, a good amount of the, the medieval period is Kabbalistic literature, uh, Kikatela, um, for example. Um, there's, uh, so that gives you a sense of what we're dealing, you know, what, what's, what it covers is a pretty wide ranging uh, list of yeah. thinkers. One of the sections, one of the questions was, um, does God intervene um, in our lives, in the case, especially in the case of suffering, and that uh, has a whole section on the Holocaust. So the, there, of course, you have Greenberg, um, and that was a hard one because, for example, in the earlier drafts of this, it had Fackenheim in it, but um, in a later dra drafts, uh, it was we put Jonas instead because I think his thought was actually more nuanced on this subject. But in the study guide, Fackenheim appears. So, it, it, you know, like sometimes there might be surprises where you're going interesting okay yeah. no i mean number one it sounds like a very nice diversity of um obviously different time periods but also uh some well-known names and some that you know unless you're very knowledgeable you might not necessarily know yeah, so i think that's wonderful first of all and uh you know I'm, I'm sure it took a lot of time to be able to get that room of people together so yeah I think that's great um let me because you mentioned the chapter on suffering, and again, I don't want to go through the whole book uh, just because I do. Ah. Want to, I, want, I want to save something for you know the person who actually uh, the people who wrote and buy it because I do think it's really interesting. Uh, the book sounds very interesting, um, but when it comes to Judaism and suffering, I'm uh, and God's intervention. I'll, I'll rephrase the question. Right. Have you found that there? do you find that there's a vast difference in the different opinions that you just lay in the book or is it more nuanced in the sense of like they'll like do you have a someone who will argue that they don't at all and then someone who says they do always or is it kind of a consensus that you know it does or doesn't and these are kind of the small ways that they do or don't if that makes sense all right so the suffering chapter i'll, I'll walk you through how it runs because then that's an easier way to answer the question because it's a good question but I, I i could easily um not make sense <laughs> no, no please whatever is comfortable for you um the biblical section is joseph the joseph story and why he decides to forgive his brothers you know he he, he suffers at their hands mm -hmm. what happens next is the um um, rabbinic section talks about Joseph and um, his his experience as well. Um, but then what happens is that there's a medieval poem that is a, um, suggests that they um, that Jews were being burned by the Romans um, on account of the the sin of having mistreated Joseph. Mm. And so that's when it starts getting more interesting. And then we and after that, I, one of the places I could have started with that was actually with the suffering servant because that shows up in the later stuff as well. 
-hmm. What happens is, is we see before the Holocaust, there are some of these kinds of conversations that are saying, if you suffer, the reason you suffer is you must have done something wrong. Mm -hmm. that, that shows up a lot. Um, it's not the only answer given, but, um, or there's also answers that give meaning to the suffering. So that, that, that was the rabbinic answer that I um, gave. The meaning in your suffering was Hermann Cohen. He's a German Jewish um, philosopher and uh, theologian um, right, who died in 1918. Um, or 1917, I'm trying to remember. Anyway, I think it's he dies in 17 and his book comes out in 18, or as he does in 18 and the book comes out in 19. I, I'm not remembering offhand. But um, he was on the subject of my dissertation, you'd think I'd remember. But hey, <laughs> no judgment, ahead. no judgment, please. <laughs> it was a lot. <laughs> uh, but what happens is, is that he's saying that the Jewish people are the suffering servant and we suffer because we're bringing monotheism to the world and that the, you know, essentially the pagan forces want to persecute us because of that. Well, that's lovely. I mean, it gives all kinds of really great meaning to our suffering. Yay. But the problem is that when you give meaning to suffering, that means that God did it that it shouldn't have been any other way, that maybe you deserved it or you're, some, or you're somehow superior because you have earned this. It, it, it becomes really problematic really fast, especially when you move into the Holocaust, because then you have this situation where the suffering exceeds anything that could have been done. You know, all of these, oh, we must have done this thing wrong, pale in comparison to the horrors. And so then you run into a genuine theological crisis of, how do you explain this? And what do you do with this? And the different people that we that I have laid out have different answers to this. Um, and all of them are hard. And, and what tends to happen is they tend to say, you know, maybe God's not as powerful, maybe God withdrew, maybe God, you know, maybe our covenant means something different than we thought it did. I mean, like it, it um, a lot of the ideas about uh, Jewish people in relationship to God get questioned in response. And that's actually the hard part about that section is this idea that um, does it change our reality? Does, this, does the Holocaust mean that our earlier theology is broken and can't be fixed? Um, and if the answer, if the question, in answer to that question, if you're talking about the idea that we always get our just desserts in, and that the suffering you get is because you earned it or because you're somehow a better person and God only gives what you can handle, that is going to break apart at some point in your life, probably. And um, because it's not, that's not a, that's not a sustaining theology. It's funny, as you were talking about this chapter, which certainly is incredibly fascinating and is one of those things that I think really no matter what time, it's a very important fundamental Jewish question. Mm -hmm. um, the two books I thought of just off the top of my head, and I don't want to get into them because we're talking about mm -hmm. this book, is I thought of uh, Jew in the Lotus. Uh, mm -hmm. where, um, I don't want to spoil it. It's a very interesting book, but there's a part where they talk about how in Jew Buddhist philosophy, you know, in the Dalai Lama, they believe that you, like in karma, so in other words, something must have happened in order for right. the Holocaust to happen, and the person who wrote the book was taken aback by that concept. And right. it's a very powerful moment. And I also thought of um, Elie Wiesel's um, The Trial of God. Um, I might be butchering the title, but um, I know everyone knows him from Night, but that's a really interesting, interesting book. And uh, I, I just, uh, I think it's wonderful that you're going through this in such a lens where we're gonna hear alternative theological perspectives on it. Right, right. So. I think uh, one of the things that I say in the book, and here's where I'm speaking as myself, and you know, because occasionally I'm allowed to break through and just say, <laughs> breaking well, the fourth wall, you are, you are a person. I break the fourth wall. Uh, exactly right. Um, well, uh, what happens is I actually think it's really problematic to give your suffering meaning. Um, I think it's, uh, and so the answer that I give on this is that there's chaos in the world, it's part of creation. That chaos means that these terrible things can happen, partly because we have free will and partly because things like mutations like cancer can happen. Um, and if you try to give theological meaning to cancer mutations or to the evil that humans can do, 
um, you put yourself into a difficult position because for, for a couple reasons. Problem number one is that if something comes along that you can't handle, then you have to give up on God. And that's, that's never a good idea. Um, and number two is um, if you make suffering have meaning, then you're okay with other people suffering. Hmm. And yeah. that, so you should never be okay with other people suffering. It, that is not going to be okay. Uh, you can't consign other people because my theology requires that you suffer, I think is a problem. Let me um, jump to one of the other chapters because you mentioned it is you mm -hmm. mentioned uh, the chapter on uh, the concept of evil mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to God. And one of the, um, we did an interview with um, an educator from a uh, Holocaust museum and mm -hmm. we ended up getting to the question of, you know, seeing the Nazis as people mm -hmm. outside of, beyond that and the complexity of the viewer and any person to see someone who they you know have done evil acts and see the humanity is a very challenging thing and is very individualized so yes I'm, I'm just curious for that chapter specifically if if it goes through the idea of is God necessarily responsible for evil or does it go into the yeah. idea of of you know what it means if we're God, if we're made in God's image and we do evil. Like, I'm, I'm curious, what's the direction if there was a singular one, because it could have, it easily could go in a million different directions yeah. that you put for that chapter. Because again, I think that's a very deep and powerful question, especially in uh, just all times, but in today's times. Yeah, um, it tends to go in the direction of uh, working through questions of free will and um, that, we have the choice. One of the one of the um, midrashim that gets that I um, quote in it is the one of um, Cain after he uh, kills his brother Abel. Mm -hmm. um, he accuses God. He says, "You made me in this way." Mm -hmm. And God says, "What have you done?" And the idea in this particular interchange is that Cain tries to blame his nature on on and blame and say, you know, God, you created me with this urge to do evil. Um, clearly, it's your fault that he's dead. Uh, clearly, you know what? And uh, the idea is that when you look at it from the perspective of God, what have you done? You have the choice to do what is good and what is or do what is evil, and you could have decided to. Um, let it go and and didn't and um i think that you know so that's the, and that's in the summation of the chapter but there's a lot of different um uh, perspectives uh, put forth and um but i i think that a good portion of the um, material tends towards the idea that um we're get you know like a, a part of the conversation in that section is about what's called the yetzer hara and yetzer hatov the the inclination to do evil the inclination to do good and how we are you know it, it works through the, actually the adam and eve story and is this how we are created and um are we predisposed to sin from birth which is incidentally um something that shows up in some of the christian theology and also in some of the um, secular philosophy like Kant is this idea that we're predisposed to do what is evil. And a lot of our literature, the, the Jewish literature tends to say, yeah, but you're also gonna do good. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a live choice for you. I mean, people can by means of conditioning or habit or um, over time build up a resistance to doing the right thing. But what happens is, is that each of us has an active choice at each point will you do the right thing or not? So when it comes to your book, because obviously there's a multitude of perspectives and while you've given us a small insight into some of the different questions that are answered, why do you think it's important for, whether it's someone who's brand new to Judaism or someone who's been going to synagogue since goodness knows how long, or is even a rabbi, a scholar, so on and so forth. Like why, why do you feel it's important for people to read a book like this? That's a great question. I think that it's important to read it because these questions, what you think about God defines what you think is possible in the world. It, it's actually a definition. Your theology um, defines what can happen. Um, is this world able to be transformed? Is this world what all there is? 
Uh, is there something greater waiting for us? Do you have the power to appeal to a force to help you? Can you uh, change in your life or are the things that happen to you uh, preordained? All of these things, you know, this defines how you're going to respond to the world. And so I think that reading a book like this, whether you're Jewish or not, whether you're knowledgeable about Judaism or not, whether you've you know, read 100 books about this or not, um, I think that encountering each of these texts and thinking it through for yourself is um, immensely helpful in that, because I, I found it helpful just writing it, because um, it gives you a chance to really reflect on what is it I believe and why, and is that, um, is my relationship to the ultimate the one I want to have? Well, I was going to also ask you, because obviously you did a lot of research and, you know, to read such different philosophers and theologians, is there something you learned about through the process of making this book that has particularly stuck with you? Like something that, you know, you may not have known before, something where you read it and it was eye-opening in some sense, because again, you're, you're dealing with such a fascinating subject and some of the greatest minds in, uh, in thought. I'm, I'm curious if anything sticks out particularly. Um, no, it's a really good question. Um, I found I wanted to go back and read more Jonas. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it wasn't one that was com covered a lot. Uh, I think the other eye-opening thing was at, um, how um, deep the feminist critique goes in the sense that um, it does, um, you have to really think through how does that change what you, you know, like how, to not think of God as a he is actually harder than it sounds. Mm. And, and, and to work past gender is a bigger deal than it sounds. And there's a lot of in, um, um, stuff that, so that, so that's why I think it's one of the stronger chapters. Um, and also the other question that really uh, keeps staying with me is this idea of how do you, um, uh, change a tradition um, if you need to. Like if, if, if you, how, how do you critique a tradition? How do you think about, a, you know, like this is our fund, like dealing with our foundational documents. How do you make that work for you really without doing violence to it? Mm. And, that, and that tension is a real one. No, that's a huge fundamental question in Judaism. I mean, just thinking about the different sects of Judaism alone and the things that have been rewritten over the years. I re remember just very briefly, um, I went to uh, a reform synagogue and they were playing music and I had mm -hmm. uh, one come who was um, more on the modern Orthodox lens and they stormed out. They just they mm -hmm. were mm -hmm. blasphemous in them. And again, it, I, I don't want anyone on the comments to give me a whole, ah! um, I just ah! want to say, However you choose to celebrate your Judaism is, is you as an individual right, absolute respect towards it. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, for some people, changing certain words is a need, and for other people, it's blasphemy. Yeah. yeah. And and so it's a very hard needle to, to tread, and I think it's interesting that that, that may be covered in the book. I, I want to leave a little mystery. Um, but I want to ask, because we keep talking about this book, and as I said, it's your first one. Uh, when does it come out? Where oh. can people find it? Because uh, I, I don't want to go through all this and then people go, well, that's great. Where, when is it coming out? Is that you can pre-order it. It's coming out on August 1st, 2020. Um, it, it comes out from Jewish Publication Society slash University of Nebraska Press. You can get, go to either website and pre-order it. So if you... Um, do a search for either name, you can find it. Also, you know, those large booksellers online that you hear about, they, they carry it too. Um, but I'm not, they don't need me to advertise them. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it's, um, so yeah, it's going to be 440 pages and um, it's right about 30 bucks. <laughs> for 440 pages, that sounds, and also, well, again, you learn everything you need to know about God. So honestly, you know, 400 pages, that, that's not bad. So. And it's intended, uh, its intended audience is a couple different groups. Uh, one is um, for the seeker, you know, if you want to know more about Jewish theology, you're interested in Jewish theology, you'd like to be, you know, you, you, you're going to grab a hold of this and read it. Uh, for book groups in congregations or for rabbis for teaching in congregations, also mm -hmm. rabbis for um, sermon ideas, 
And then it's also for uh, introduction to, to Judaism or introduction to Jewish thought, Jewish God concept courses in the university setting. Um, so it's intended to be uh, accessible for like an undergraduate. So in other words, you made it very niche. So no. I'm, oh yeah, absolutely. I'm, uh, okay. <laughs> if you write 440 pages, you want to make sure somebody. <laughs> no, but but honestly, it's, the book, to say the very least, it, it sounds wonderful. And as you maybe could tell through this interview, it's very thought provoking, which is, I think when you can read anything and it provokes thought, I think is always a wonderful thing. So um, before we, we go, I wanna know uh, for anyone who's curious to learn more about you and to, you know, where's a good place to, to find you? Okay, um, I, oh, that's a very good question. Uh, <laughs> well, you, you, you can look at me up in, in uh, Glastonbury and with Congregation Kol Chavarim, or you can also, I do actually have a blog, although it hasn't been um, updated in a while, but it's uh, Rav Carey um, at, it, blog at Rob Carey. <laughs> so, and um, I, I will be angry at myself if I don't ask the obvious question. Um, do you have any thoughts on the next project or after this, you're just going to lay back, ah. enjoy the home because we're not allowed to go out yet. Uh, not, you know, but is there thoughts on a potential uh, next book? Uh, I haven't yet, you know, like I, um, I haven't yet got that far, but I would actually love to write my own, write out my own theology as a book. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and and try to join those ranks. That that's been my long term goal. But this is the book actually why why I got the PhD. I wrote the book that I wanted to write. <laughs> well, that's always a wonderful blessing. I want to thank you so much for making the time today to speak with us and talk about your upcoming book. Uh, to everyone who's watching, I hope you'll uh, you'll look up the book and uh, you know you'll maybe want to make a purchase. It sounds really interesting, really fascinating. Um, everyone, of course, stay healthy. Stay safe. Uh, continue to watch our videos and uh, carry an app. Uh, do sorry, Rabbi Doctor. Ah, it's fine. I wanted to plug it in. Um, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you. It's been an honor.